Thank you. So yeah, today we're going to learn about the virtual environment, and I have to make a confession. This talk is marked as a beginner, and which is true that I'm not expecting from you any kind of previous knowledge, but we're going to dive in quite deep into the Python interpreter and its uh, implementation details, so it's going to be a bit dense. To make it a bit more sweet, I did brought a few nice pictures of my Yorkshire Terrier puppy. He is silky, he's just uh, five months old. And this is basically his, uh, just after he got home, his first picture with a tennis ball in his mouth. So similar to him, we'll get onto a course to actually discover how virtual environments work underneath. Okay? So, just a quick intro, who am I? Yeah, I'm the maintainer of the virtual tool, which hopefully would make me quite uh, competent to talk about this subject. I'm a member of the Py Python Packaging Authority, and I'm quite active in the open source space, and you can find my contributions under this GitHub handle, Gabor Bernat. And I'm also maintainer of the Tux tool, uh, which heavily uses virtual uh, This is one of the main reasons I became maintainer of the virtual tool. A lot of Tux tools, Tux box, are kind of like virtual box, so might as well fix it there. And I'm also a software engineer at Bloomberg, working mostly at data ingestion pipeline inside the company. So, what is a virtual environment? Luckily, I don't have to come up with the definition. The PEP 405 defines it very clearly. It's an isolated Python environment that has access to its own site package, shares access to the host built-in standard library, option isolated from the system site packages, and this is the point where you're like, whoa, what are all these kind of random definitions that you're throwing out, and why? What do we want to do here? And in order to understand this better, let's step one, let's take one step back and actually cover, so how do we actually get hold of a Python module? Python is this famous language in which you can do pretty much everything by in some package that is implemented and you can get hold of via some module, but how do you actually get hold of that module? And the answer is basically in this SKCD slide, which basically means if you want to basically use anything, all you need to do is basically import it like that. So. The thing is, you know, the way you get something is by importing it. So how does the importing system work? Well, pretty much you just specify import, you specify what you want to import, and then in the next line you can already magically use it. But the question is, what actually happens under the hood when you say that import.sys? Okay? Uh, and another kind of like complication around this is that not, mo not all modules are equal. For example, if I look at the sys, I can see that even if I print the representation, this is a built-in module. If I look at the OS module, you can see that that kind of like has a file inside that opt Python 3.7 blah 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 dash os.py. Similarly, the .csv, this is more interesting because it's actually, you can see this implementation is an SO file, which is kind of like a DLL for on the Windows. Then you have PyTumble, which is a different location, or I can have like here py 517, which is even a different location. So as you can see, just by the fact they're living in different places, they are considered different type of modules. Like this one is a built-in module, the OS one is a standard library module. This is the module that come if you install if you, just Python built into the standard library. And then we have also standard library module by dynamic module. These are modules that are, are, would be slow to actually implement it within Python. So what the core developer team does, they implement the actual underlying implementation inside C, and then they just create a, a slight um, front proxy to that. That's why in this case you can see this is actually underscore CSV and not CSV, because the CSV is basically just a slight proxy. The actual implementation, the performance implementation is the underscore one, and that's available under some actual binary code. Okay, and then we have this import PyTumble, and this is a global site package, and it differs from the user site package in a sense that this is actually available on the system path, while this other one is basically available on the user side path. Okay, like you can see, this users burn at that dot local, which is kind of like the user's home. Okay, so the next section is, okay, now that we know that we import things, how does the importer work? And this is something that has evolved throughout the Python's life, but this is how it works in 3.7. Uh, it works similarly on Python 2, but the only difference is that there you could not modify this, so it's not as easily exposed, so we can actually inspect it. But the idea is that Python doesn't know if something is importable or not. It just basically goes with the principle that try first, ask for forgiveness later. So it tries to import all the actual packages, 
and it has a list of importers if knows, and it just asks in order each importer, hey, can you give me this sys? If yes, it's going to return that. It's not going to follow any further to the further imports. The first one can, can return it in the order. That's the one that Winston actually provides that module for you. So the, we have the built-in importer. This is the first one. The built-in importer imports elements, which are literally compiled within the C Python binary, and, or like the Python binary. And in this case, it's actually a such example is the sys itself. Like, you're not going to find a sys.py anywhere. It's literally available already inside the binary itself. Then we have the frozen importer. By default, some things can be, like, everything can be put straight into your Python binary. And the way you do it is basically you freeze it. And the freezing means I take your Python code, I compile it into the something machine code, and I literally attach it into the Python binary. And because this is no longer lives anywhere on the file system, it's also not on the known namespace of the built-in. It has this frozen importer, which going to know at which location inside that binary I'm going to be able to find that element. Or my final option, at least in the default, is the pathfinder. And the pathfinder, as its name kind of like hints at, it basically looks at the operating system file system and will try to find it somewhere there. Okay? So let's investigate later. The pathfinder is basically just give me somewhere on the file system. Uh, and it doesn't operate. It has its own configuration. And the main configuration for this is going to be actually the information that you find in the sys.path. Okay? And the sys.path is basically a list of locations where this importer will try to look and find if that package is there. If in any of the, and this, again, we're going to do it in the order. And the first one is going to find it. That's what's going to be returned to you. Okay? So we have, you can have multiple elements, but this is like a list of default that I get on my MacBook, for example. You can see this third one is basically a zip file, like we can even import from zips itself. This is the first place it's going to look. Then it's going to look in this sender library directory. Then we have this lib download, which is basically where we store the C extensions for the sender library. Or we have the user size package or global site package. Okay? So now that we know all this, we can actually interpret this definition. So a virtual environment is just an isolated Python environment that has access to its own site package. So it must have something else besides what is there. OK? But the system when it basically has access, while well, it has access to the sender library path plus the user and the global site package, the virtual env may or may not actually have access to the global one. So like in this case, you can see it has the first three, they are the sender library locations, and the fourth element is basically its own site package. Or if you configure it to also have access to the global site package, it's going to append to the end of this list the user and the global site package. Okay? So virtual environment is nothing else, just a Python executable that whenever it starts up, it's magically going to make available its own site package folder and may or may not disable the global one. Okay? Quite simple. So the question is, why do you want to do this? And the reason for why is because this will allow you to actually install packages that our system administrator writes, because we saw everything else other than user site package was available, only modifiable by the system Python. So if you don't have admin rights, you will not might be install it. The, you also have the option that you can create easily and reproduce test environments. You don't have to reinstall your entire operating system just to test your package. You can just create a virtual environment, and it's going to be exactly the same as you would have done that. And it's also easier dependency management. And the way this manifests is that in practice, you would uh, have multiple uh, dependencies. And if two tools, if you would install everything in a, system, a single global size site package, you may end up in the situation when two of the site packages have conflicting dependency requirements. And this would mean that basically by just installing a new package into that environment, you break another one which was already there. Okay? And it is also just allows you, for as more like as a testing, the ability to easily test against multiple dependencies easily without having have to go too hard about it. Okay. So let's see how this actually works. Okay? So in the next, we're going to try to look into... I told you already that basically what going to determine what is a module is going to be this sys.path where something going to be loaded is the sys.path. Okay? Now, this sys.path, the question one could ask, OK, Bernard, but who comes up with this is, OK? Like, this is just magically made up? Or, and what more, if you start up in a different platform, it may well be the case that, not will, may well be, it technically 
for sure going to be the case that you're going to have a totally system, totally different type of layout here, or you may have more or less elements. Okay? So, the question to this is before, at the moment at least, there is different location where the standard library is identified, and there's a different location where the other side packages are inside. All the standard library discovery happens straight into the Python binary, so this is kind of like a built-in logic. And then, inside whatever customizes the global side packages is the side.py. This is at least in most of the case. You can disable the side.py. We're not going to cover that case too much, but in that case, the built-in interpreter is going to fall back into some built-in logic. But this is very rare in practice. You're most often, what's going to happen is that on your machine, in the standard library, they're going to be the side.py, which is going to magically customize and be, come up with the global and the user side packages. Okay? So, if you can look at it, you see there's some commonality in this. In all those other packages which are outside of the virtual MC's own site package and the user home site package, all these other ones start with this magic prefix called OptPython 3.7. And this is a good reason, because the way this list is generated is basically by using some prefixes. There is these two variables that you can change, but they automatically going to have some same defaults. Sys prefix and sys.exec prefix, and this is basically what's going to determine where the Python going to try to find this inf these uh, packages. Okay? Now, obviously, Python doesn't just magically come up with, yeah, it's right here, it's like a very hard-code version, it's actually dynamic, and what ends up happening is that there's a different algorithm that comes up with this logic, and this is actually available mostly in getpad.c. This has changed quite a few times, as the CPython core team, for example, started optimizing startup, and they needed to move around things to make things faster. But the rule of thumb is that if you set the Python home, we're going to use that for this prefix. So this is a great thing if you want to break someone's environment. You just set the Python home environment variable to something that doesn't exist, and everything's going to be broken. So, but otherwise, if this environment variable doesn't exist, we actually are looking for a landmark file, and the landmark file chosen is actually this os.py. So the Python is going to start from its own executable, where the Python executable itself is, and we're going to start going up, and at each level we're going to see, can I find this libpythonx.epsilonos.py file? If I can find it, that is what six.prefix will be. Okay? And another, uh, otherwise, it's going to be like a built in hard coded value, but this more like a fallback most likely will not work. Because this is whatever the compile, whoever compiled your Python set is going to be exactly that one. And there is a different logic for the exact prefix, which is basically the C extension modules. The only difference is that in this case, it's not going to look for the os.py file. Instead, it's going to look for the lib download element, okay, the folder. And wherever it finds its folder, that's what the exact prefix is going to be set to. So, that's more or less it. We only need, to, if you want to create a virtual environment, like roll your own almost, the only thing you have to do is modify the six exact prefix and six prefix. If you're done with this, you're, all your power is in your hand. So, how we created this environment? In order to have shared access to the host, we just need to make sure that whenever Python starts up, it's going to resolve the standard library element by having available those uh, two landmark files, the file and the folder. Okay? If you want to actually create, we want to have uh, the system side package added or not, this is just a conditional logic in the side.py. The side.py automatically gets loaded before any code gets executed at the startup of your folder. So if we do any changes here, whenever the user will get the interpreter, we'll already have a modified sys that path that is going to work for him. And similarly, adding our own virtual environment side packages is basically just, just some logic that we can toss in into the side.py. Okay? So what are the changes needed to actually have a virtual environment? So I just take a Python executable, and I want to not use the system one. Well, we just need to, need to keep track of the host so I can actually find the global uh, standard library. We just need to know where that was available, so I can set the sys prefix according to that, and just some flags into the side.py for anything. Now, according to the path 508, this configuration information is actually stored in this pyvm.cfg, and this is something that Python 3.3 or later actually already will parse and read, and the way it's going to 
set the standard libraries for the standard library sys.profix is going to be basically going to look at whatever that home value is. Okay? If that home value points to something from where it can find those landmark files, you're going to be happy. It's going to resolve your correct system side packages. Uh, and otherwise, just the fact that should we add the include system side packages is just this second argument that include system side packages equals false. And the fact that should we add the virtual environment side.py or not is basically just done by is this file exist? Then yes, if not, we should not bother with that, okay? So quite simple and straightforward in that sense. Now there's one more thing. If you create a virtual environment, the, it's gonna be not going to be much of a use if you can't install packages in it. So the first thing that you'll have to do once you create a virtual environment, you be a, want to be able to put a uh, pip into it. Now this is kind of a catch-22, because usually whenever someone says, install a package, you just go, yeah, I use pip to install it. But in this case, we don't actually have at this point any pip in that package yet. So how do we install pip without pip? And the way we resolve this catch-22 is basically we put, we have a will of the whatever we want to install, or a zip file of the pip, and we can actually put this onto the sys.pat, and this is basically going to mean that for that invocation, Pip is going to be available, we're going to be lookable by the importing system, so it's going to be able to start up. And then we're going to ask Pip, can you please install yourself by using this wheel that I just pointed to you at? And pretty much this is what it's going to self-install it itself, and pretty, pretty much what Ensure Pip more or less does. It does a bit more magic, but this is the core gist of it. Okay? So, now we have a virtual environment. It has a lovely Pip in it. We're kind of like done, yeah? Well. Now let's have a quick look at implementations. So the implementations out there available, the one that's recommended for use, so to say, is the VM. The VM is a standard library module. It's built in within the interpreter. And it works on only Python 3.3 only. But hey, Python 2 is going to be deprecated next year, so who cares? It's going to be also available uh, of the standard library. Well, mostly, because like Debian derivatives decide not to install it. So, and its only main scope is it's going to be able only to target itself. So if you want to create a Python 3.4 or 3.6 virtual env, you must have available Python 3.6 or 3.4 with virtual env within it to be able to do it. Okay? Now there's another thing called out here, and this is for what I'm the maintainer, is this virtual env thing. And how virtual env differs from that built-in VM? Should this project even exist anymore, or can we just drop it? And in order to answer this question, let's quickly go over what virtual env offers on top of VM, OK? So the first thing out is, is that it's a third-party package, which means that you can upgrade it out of the band. So you no longer have to wait for your operating system to upgrade your Python. You can literally get the latest virtual env creation by just installing this package, OK? So in that case, it's a bit more future-proof. It's a bit more easier to have the latest of it with the latest features. It also targets to support both Python 2 and 3. And it supports C, Python, and PyPy. We have some Jython implementation. Iron Python is something that may be a work in progress. But if you have an interpreter and you want to have a virtual end for it, and maybe you don't necessarily want it within your standard library, just submit a pull request. And if it looks good, we're going to accept it. It also has cross Python support, meaning that you can actually, if you install virtual end on Python 3.4, it's going to be able to create for you virtual env for all supported Pythons, OK? So even if the VM package is not there for the 3.6, it's still going to be able to create a virtual environment for that 3.6. This makes it very useful for tools such as Tux, pipenv, all these tools, or pipix, all these tools, because now they can actually don't have to check if the virtual env is correctly set up or not. They can actually just have a look at it. And they can just use this tool, and this is guaranteed to be work for all available Python executables, OK? Another thing is cross platform support, obviously. And it has built in interpreter discovery, meaning that, and this is especially handy on the Windows, you don't even, we automatically dis discover all Pythons available or try to do our best, all Pythons available in your operating system. So you don't have to figure out, hey, is my Python 3.4 on the pet? Is Python 3.7? on the path, especially on Windows. For example, the path 504 allows on Windows tools to actually register their Python existence within the Windows registry. And the virtual I'm automatically going to load this, and it will be able to, you can just specify to it that dash p, I want the Python 3.4, and we're going to discover it and create it using that. And similarly, we're going to use the path discovery method by using uh, 
PEP 394. This basically means that we're going to be able to create, you're going to have a single virtual AMP floor creator for all the Pythons, and you don't have to use, have different form for different Python versions. Okay? So, and it also has its own bundle pip setter sweep to the bootstrap, meaning that it can work in offline bond, but it's also available to use index servers, so it's possible to install the latest one, rather than whatever we distributed the last package with. Okay? So you may have like a newer pip setup tools wheel, and this in turn causes that you have less time, the awkward case when something doesn't work, you go to Stack Overflow and they, did you upgrade your pip? And you're like, okay, okay, now it works. So, Let's have a bit of, the other thing is though, because we need to support Python 2, virtual AMP works a bit differently than VM. Anything I, everything I told you on the beginning of the, the VM, that PyVM, the CFG, is not a thing in virtual AMP. So let's go over how virtual AMP does actually create a virtual environment. So we have to basically do the same, on the, alter the standard library logic discovery and alter the side.py logic to be able to create a virtual AMP, but without the interpreter having any knowledge of any configuration files. And the way we do this is basically, the first thing is, we always copy the, on Python 2 at least, the executable, and we put it in a folder that looks like, kind of like a Python virtual environment, okay? Under like bin, in like in this macro OS. Then we create the two landmark files. We just simlink this to the operating system one, so they actually contain the same thing as the operating system one. Then we add a few configuration. We have a configuration flag if you should add the, system Python or not, what is the prefix from where the Python that we created with is available, and we inject our own side.py. Now, the reason we need to inject our own side.py is because the side.py that is shipped by operating system is not aware of this magical auric prefix txt or no global prefix txt. So the, if you would use the side.py that is shipped with the operating system, that would magically ignore all these configurations, and you would not get an actual virtual amp. So for this reason, we have to, like, whenever you use a virtual amp, we have to, like, basically lie to you and have our own side.py that kind of, like, works for all platforms out there. Now, you can imagine if this works for all platforms and all Pythons, it's not too easy to maintain. So. There's one more thing. The side.py is going to take care of adding everything on the pad, but there's a caveat. It seems the side.py doesn't work on its own in magic. Just it, it actually works by using Python standard library modules. But at this point, at the point the side.py gets loaded, those are not yet on the pad. So, okay, this means that in order to be able to load or start up this side.py file and that's going to do the modification, we first need to be able to modify the to be, have available all those packages that side.py happens to use. Now, this is a short list of what we need, basically. And again, this is kind of like platform dependent and each and version dependent. So yeah, you can see that we create a lot more links or copy them literally over the sender priority, just so that our customization logic is able to run. And yeah, it's few, I meant 21 in this case. I don't know, quoting a recent show, not great, not terrible. Could be 60 or 60, so 25 maybe, let's work with it. And then we just have to do some fix up, basically add some activation scripts, link the include, fix up the disk tools, because turns out the disk tools uses its own kind of side package discovery, so we have to basically ship a different disk tools than your operating system. And then we just fix all other bugs that are available. A long list of it, like being able to discover TLK platforms, having Python coffee run, the documentation run. You can see there's a long list of fixes that we have to do for this to work. And just, yeah, that's more or less this. Now, just to have a bigger thing, in this virtual environment, the only thing that we actually care is that lonely side of packages. Everything else is just there to make things work. And just for a comparison, this is what VM has. Looks a lot slimmer, no? So, and the reason why it can get away with having this lot slimmer package, this lot slimmer directory is three, is because it's able to, the interpreter itself is able to know about virtual environments, and the interpreter itself is able to basically load these configurations from that PyVM that does CFG across it. Okay? So yeah, next time you create a virtual environment and you see this on the, your hard drive, don't despair, it's just how it is. Obviously, this is not a good uh, way to have things, and because we basically said before we patch both the side.py and the disk utils, 
as opposed to what your distribution ships with. We have a lot of bug reports around ID doesn't work on this magic random platform because basically that has a customized uh, disk utility, so the side.py, and various features start breaking. And because this is kind of like hard to maintain, I start doing a rewrite, and this is my proposal. Basically, the idea is that it's going to still be offered as a third package, so this is what's going to differentiate from VM. It's going to also have all Python implementations welcomed. This means including Python 2 and 3, uh, like PyPy, is, even to the C Python going to be deprecated next year. PyPy is going to be su supported, it's two versions going to support it for a foreseeable future, so we still need to be able to create virtual environments for that interpreter. So we're still going to support that. We're also going to have a two years grace period, meaning that, well, I put here two years, but maybe I'm going to make a year and a half. The idea is that we're going to maintain our virtual env to be compatible with the Python that has dropped support for its um, implementation a bit earlier. And the reason we want to do this is that you're most likely, unless you live in a perfect world, you'll not be able to migrate to the latest, fanciest Python immediately. And we want to make your life a bit easier. You still can use virtual env to actually create VMs for your favorite deprecated Python. So it's also going to be able to select target Pythons. It can even do fancy things such as, for example, request a given subversion or request a given architecture on Windows. Uh, again, this is kind of like maybe not as interesting for the end user, but it's something that tools definitely want, and it's very handy. And one thing in order to minimize the bug request, we actually going to, what we're going to do is we're basically going to ask if possible, we're going to delegate the work to the VM in the spirit of why work if others can work for you. But we're basically just going to make add a few optimizations on top of it. And we're going to have like a broad shell activation support. This is something that differentiates for us, for example, also from the VM, that we actually support a lot other shells than whatever the standard library does. For example, we support the Sonosh Python shell interpreter. And also, we're able to move much faster. For example, when PowerShell all of a sudden become available on the POS6 operating system 2, we immediately added that now we generate that, generate that activation script on that platform too. Okay? And we're going to keep doing that. And we're going to make sure that its features work similarly. And we have a three-layered configuration system, which basically is going to allow you to have some global settings customize how virtual are created on your hard drive. And the kind of things that you can, this can be useful is, for example, whenever Peep releases a new version and for some reason it's broke, broke, you can set it at operating system level that I actually want to use an older Peep and create all my virtual environments with an older Peep, not a late, but still the last known working version or something like that. Okay? And we might also have a plugin system for extension. This is mostly something used that people are able to create their virtual environment implementations for their Pythons without necessarily having to get a pull request to us. You can basically load and add, test it on your own. And then if it's stable, we can upstream it within virtual env itself. OK? So yeah, that's going to be all my talk. I think I might have a question left or so. So yeah, thank you. So thank you very much uh, for this uh, rare insight. Um, there is time for one quick question. And any other questions, uh, you will be around afterwards. So feel free to, to do that um, after the talk. So is there any quick question? What we, oh, sorry. Go, go on, yes. Um, thank you for that. It was really interesting to see the internals. You said you were planning on doing a rewrite, which would include kind of support to select any Python version. Yes. Obviously, Say you're doing front end, you can use like MVM at the minute to kind of proactively select any node version. Right now, what is your kind of go to for downloading and managing Python versions as opposed to virtual ems? Uh, for Python versions, I either install it from the upstream or I install it, for example, using uh, PyMV, PyVM, or I, other thing which I sometimes I use Conda, which has. But like this, for example, would allow us to even you be able to say that you want a Conda environment. And if you have Conda inside the, the system, it would be Conda would actually create the, its own specific environment. And that could be still managed by the single front end of the virtual env. Instead of having to use multiple tools, mm -hmm. virtual env would kind of act like its unified exactly. interface, which is very nice for tools especially. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Right. So, one, one last thank you and uh, welcome for this talk. And then. Um, that's it. Thank you, guys.